This week, a number of major companies, including Disney and American Airlines, announced new layoffs. With big parts of the economy still hurting from the coronavirus, many are having to scale back. But some older Americans were already living a minimalist lifestyle on the road. Our economics correspondent Paul Salman has their story. It's part of our Making Sense series, Unfinished Business. And a note, portions of the story were shot before the pandemic. This whole entire industry is just exploding right now. At Nomadic Customs, Mark Vroman and his crew retrofit vehicles to live in. I think with the combination of just how things are in the world right now, people are really wanting to jump into vans and, and buses and just alternative housing situations. These days, the hashtag van life business is booming. Romans hired eight new workers, but still can't keep up. At last count, I think I had something like 180 estimates to write, probably another 400 emails to return. And yesterday alone, we received 37 phone calls. I feel like I hopped onto a rocket ship and I've just been doing everything I can to hold on. The last half year of lost jobs has spurred a desire to escape. Cheap mobile living enables it. But lots of folks, many older, were on the road before the van life hashtag inspired by this 65 year old living in nature wouldn't you like to be out here and see and live like this youtube celeb bob wells moved into a van 25 years ago when divorce left him unable to meet the rent in anchorage alaska i knew i could live comfortably in a van on 1400 a month because no house payment no utility payments i had solar i was my own utility company it worked really well I enjoyed it. Uh, that was the amazing thing. Enjoyed it so much, in fact, he created a website, CheapRVLiving.com, and then a YouTube channel to teach others to downsize and thrive on wheels. Finding heat in your van is a really important issue for a lot of us. Everything you need to do to stay clean is right here. The topic of today is poop. You can just sit right straight down on a bucket. Wells' videos, uh, viewed over 80 million times, preach the simple life, especially appealing right now to those ages 55 to 70, some 3 million of whom have been shoved out of the workforce. 25% of Americans don't have a penny saved towards retirement. Yeah. So in 5, 10, 20 years, that 25% are going to be living on Social Security. And Social Security won't be enough for them to live on. Thanks for all you do. Thank you. Every winter in Quartzsite, Arizona, Wells devotees convene at the RTR, the well, Rubber it's Tramp it's Rendezvous, it's for seminars and community. Man, it's like a disciple. <laughs> You're Moses and I'm the disciple. You're oh. spreading the word. Uh. Wells, a self-described introvert, is their celebrity guru. There's a lot of us here who are on Social Security, and their Social Security is anywhere from 600 to 1,000 a month. And so you can see they couldn't rent a home on that. But when they move into their vans, most of them slowly have to start dipping into their savings, their emergency fund. And so most of them will have to work sometime to replenish it. So the topic of one RTR huddle, earning on the web. If you're not monetizing it, meaning you're not making money through your website or social media, then you're kind of missing out. Well, hello, YouTube family. Inspired by Wells' success, most people here seem to have a YouTube channel of their own. We're Camper Size Living. And where can we find you? YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. YouTuber Linda Mastromonaco lives in her SUV, sleeps in the front seat. I curl up, I stretch out this way, I stretch out this way. Two years ago, Mastromonaco gave up her apartment, quit the last of her low-paying, no-benefits jobs. Target, Kroger's, Chico's, all the retail, I, I have waitressing background, just all kinds of things where you're on the treadmill, just trying to, to really literally make ends meet. She now lives on the road, hawks inspirational cards online, has posted hundreds of videos to her YouTube channel. I am back on the road. Up to nearly 30,000 subscribers. More people are feeling stuck right now and making a plan when they can leave. How's your YouTube channel doing in terms of income? Income has exploded over the last couple months. I was averaging, you know, $600 a month, and I'm over two grand for this month. Hi, I'm Steve Turtle, and I'm a work camper. Steve Turtle gives his YouTube followers the down and dirty on work camping, working seasonal jobs while camping, that is. I want to show you how I clean toilets. Woo! <laughs> 
That's how you clean a South Carolina toilet right there. Turtle's been hamming it up online for over two years. YouTube rewards you for people watching your videos and the commercial. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Here Carol we Meeks has a YouTube cooking for channel for nomads on a tight budget. Some people are living on five to six hundred dollars a month. So, I mean, we're not going to be having salmon and crab legs. You can do a lot of things for a dollar a serving if you know how to shop, you know, and if you're creative in how you're cooking. I'm planning on becoming the Anthony Bourdain of van life, okay? You can wash your hair and you got some pressure. But how many itinerants can support themselves on YouTube earnings like Bob Wells? For most people, it's not realistic. The idea of making thousands, very few do that. Consider Steve Turtle's YouTube take. I was somewhere around 150 a month. And then in March, it sort of fell apart. There was just not a lot going on. Turtle stopped live streaming when COVID hit. We are live. He's back at it, but hasn't reached YouTube's pay threshold. I don't think uh, I'm going to try to survive off of YouTube. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to my next video. But if you, like Bob Wells, managed to go viral, pardon the expression, you make 75 grand a year from YouTube. That's what I read, anyway. I make an amazing amount of money from YouTube. <laughs> more, more than 75,000, I take it. An amazing amount of money. <laughs> you wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't believe it. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, yeah, so, so what do you do with the money? I, I give it away. What do I need money for? I live in a van. Indeed, Wells has started a nonprofit to provide homes on wheels for folks in need, in tune with his YouTube channel's goal to lend a helping hand. Uh, I've been devastated in life. In 2011, uh, I have two sons, and one of my sons took his life. That's the only reaction possible. There's nothing like it. It just, how do you, how do you express it? Every morning, uh, you wake up and say, how can I be alive on a planet on which he's not here? And so the adequate answer is I have something to give. He gives, his followers receive. Carol Meek's YouTube channel has grown since we met in the winter. Just under 4,400 subscribers. And, and I actually think that that's been impacted because of COVID, because so many people are looking for entertainment and engagement, and they're doing it online. In January, she was forming friendships with fellow nomads in the flesh. Since the pandemic, virtual bonds. I have met so many people online and so many other people who have channels who are in this type of lifestyle. So I, I feel like I have a community. Carol Meeks, like so many older Americans, oh. seems to have found a new tribe. On the road, online. Take care, friends. For the PBS NewsHour, this Bye. is Paul Salmon. The pandemic has spurred a surge in camping and RV travel as social distancing has become one of the catchphrases of COVID-19. But it's not all fun and vacations. One group of Americans has long since adopted a self-sufficient lifestyle, living full-time in motorhomes and working seasonal jobs to support themselves. Our economics correspondent Paul Salmon has the story. It's part of our Making Sense series, Unfinished Business. And a note, some of the story was shot before the pandemic began. This is the couch that turns into a bed. Uh -huh. To Darla McLean, 64, and husband Bill, also 64, a former biker and hellraiser, this is home sweet home. Our whole bedroom is done in Levi's. These are all my old pants. The McLeans have been living in an RV since 2010, after the Great Recession sank their L.A. motorcycle repair shop and their home. We had a $700,000 house that we owed about uh, $200,000 on that sold for $131,000. On the auction block broke, the McLean sold what was left and hit the road. I mean, it was that or rent an apartment and get jobs locally, but there were no jobs. So they drove to where the work was. Our first job was Amazon in Coffeyville, Kansas. A two month stint in the warehouse, holiday rush. It was pretty rough. They expect certain numbers and you have to hustle. Bill over hustled. He blew his knee out. I don't normally walk at 60 miles an hour pushing a heavy cart going around 90 degree turns. Amazon was the first of some 20 seasonal gigs. When we first met them last fall, the McLeans were parked across from a Las Vegas Ikea to peddle pumpkins and then Christmas trees. With us, we have what we call wheel estate. We just, we just 
take the covers off, lift the <laughs> levelers, fire it up, and we go where the economy is good. Tens of thousands of retirement age Americans are migrant laborers or work campers, driven by economic necessity and wanderlust. This is Judy Arnold's fourth year work camping. She's been tending a store in Yellowstone National Park since June. It wasn't very busy at first, but as time went on, it got busier and busier until we have more people now than we have had in regular seasons. People were just tired of being cooped up at home and they thought, let's go to, you know, the parks. More sightseers drawn away from COVID and back to nature means a lot more work for a work camper like Arnold. I'm doing the work of three people right now. The pandemic has driven an awful lot of Americans onto the road. But the number of mobile living, gig hopping work campers has been growing for years. Every January, hordes convene in Quartzsite, Arizona, the site of an annual RV show. That's where we met 66-year-old Susan Otteros. You end up in these really neat places, like Yosemite. Otteros works as a camp host, main tasks, checking in campers, and if you're up for it, cleaning. I don't do the bathrooms. <laughs> My boyfriend does the bathrooms. I collect the money. <laughs> Mitch Craighead drafts camp hosts for a thousand trails campsites. How many 75 year olds do you recruit? More than you'd expect. Baby boomers are retiring. The pool of workers that we're hiring for is growing dramatically. That was in January. The company declined to give us specifics, but Mitchell says campgrounds are busier than ever these days. We've always looked at ourselves in the camping industry as the original social distancing. And a lot of our new customers are telling us just that. We've seen a significant spike in reservations um, for the remainder of the camping year this year. At the RV show, work camping veterans Rick and Tammy Womack moved into their motorhome nine years ago after their son died by suicide. We started out with what we call our journey for Joshua, which was to honor our son. But the reality after about three years was it's expensive to live on the road. You need new tires, maintenance costs are high. And big campers get just seven miles a gallon. So for the past seven years, they've worked the North Dakota sugar beet harvest. I didn't even know what a sugar beet was. Well, I thought sugar came from sugar cane. Because where I come from, it does. You know, Dick's a crystal. But instead, 55% uh, of our sugar comes from sugar beets instead of sugar cane in the country. Muddy 12-hour shifts at $14 an hour plus overtime until the beets run out. Some nomad gigs pay a lot more than that. Ms. J transports RVs from manufacturer to dealer and sees the country. I can pick the jobs I want to take to go see various destinations. So if there's an RV that needs to go to Florida, which I have done this, delivered in Miami, I went on over to Key West. And how much do you get paid for that? I would say somewhere between 60 and 75. That's sixty to seventy-five thousand dollars a year, driving four days a week. These days, RVs are selling like hotcakes, but Ms. J is sitting out the pandemic in a tiny house in Georgia until next year. Cases are up, especially for you know certain communities, communities of color, and I'm I know quite a few of people who have been affected, and so I I just kind of choose to lay low until things kind of, you know, simmer down a little bit. <laughs> can you afford to? I can. I've been doing this pattern over a number of years where I was able to financially prepare myself for the what ifs. And this is one of those what ifs. Back in January, in the big tent, there were hawkers of tire pressure monitors, RV window cleaners, orthotics. We reconnected with Bill and Darla McLean who driven here from Mexico, where they go for affordable health care. Shrimp tacos are killer. <laughs> we have a great pharmacist down there. We get glasses and our teeth worked on. I don't know why, how they can charge so much for stuff here that you can go right down there and get the same thing for a fraction of the cost. But the McLeans were at the RV show for a gig to sign up other work campers as oil field gate guards. You have to man the gate 24 hours a day. Um, they pay 150 a day for that. Now look, work camping obviously isn't for everyone. Does this interest you? No, not at all. And why is that? Because I retired for a reason. I don't want to go back to work. But Bill and Sandy Collins liked what they heard. They work camp, helping fund their wanderings. We work um, Adventureland, then we go to JCPenney's, and then... Doing what? Uh, working in the warehouse at JCPenney's. 
Even in bankruptcy, J.C. Penney's warehouse is still running, and as at Amazon, you have to step lively. On Thursday, I walked 23,355 steps. According to 72-year-old Bill's smartphone, that is. You know, and as long as I keep doing it, then, then I think my health is going to stay a lot better than, than I would if I sat down. That's one of the appeals of work camping to George Stoutenberg. I can't see myself stopping work. I can't do nothing. What, what is nothing? You sit around and, what, wait to die? It's not me. But he also needs the money. It's not like we're broke, but we're certainly not, you know, millionaires. We can't afford to just travel the world and do whatever we want to do. That would be a wonderful thing, but it's not my life. Judy Arnold's current Yellowstone gig has kept her more than busy, but when it ends in October, she isn't sure what she'll do. There's a huge population of us that are still in limbo, wondering if there is a next job to go to. And a lot of my coworkers, where they normally go, the places aren't open. So I'm definitely worried because I definitely need an income. Stupid glue, too. As for Bill and Darla McLean, they've been parked outside their daughter's house in Arkansas for several months, making repairs to the RV. I think for the most part, uh, we've been surviving and trying to just get through this like most people are. It is a little weird for RVers. I know that for a fact. Uh, it's not the easiest thing in the world to find it's a place. It's not really that we can't travel. It's just once you get where you're going. And where do you stay? But this weekend, they're getting back on the road, headed to a new job, working, and hoping to find places to camp. For the PBS NewsHour, this is Paul Salmon. Finally tonight, the latest selection for our Now Read This book club, Jessica Bruder's Nomadland, documents a growing phenomenon in the country, and it was the inspiration for the new movie of the same name. Just this week, the film was the big winner at the British Academy Film Awards. And later this month, it vies at the Oscars with nominations for Best Picture, director Chloe Zhao, and actress Frances McDormand. Jeffrey Brown has our book conversation for our ongoing arts and culture series, Canvas. In the new drama Nomadland, we meet a group of mostly older Americans who've lost jobs, savings, and homes in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis. Several of the key characters are played by real nomads, whose lives were first captured in the nonfiction book on which the film is based. Nomadland, Surviving America in the 21st Century. Author Jessica Bruder spent several years immersed in this life. I asked her to describe what she called a new wandering tribe. These are people who got caught between flat wages and rising rents, in the failures of retirement finance, in the collapses of the Great Recession. They're people who realized that, for most Americans, our biggest cost is housing and decided that if they gave up traditional housing and moved into a van, an RV, in some cases a sedan, that they could live a life that would be in some ways simpler, traveling from place to place and getting different seasonal jobs all over the country. The mm -hmm. subtitle of the book is Surviving America in the 21st Century. That word survival, how did people manage it? I remember talking to this woman, Linda May, who is the main character in the book, and she was telling me that with so much ageism in the workplace, she was shocked to go online and realize that some of these jobs for seasonal workers were, high, were hiring and wanted 50 plus people like her. So I think a lot of the people I met were using this lifestyle as a hack to get around these economic impossibilities that a lot of Americans are facing today. And that made them incredibly creative and resilient. And so you're describing people working in Amazon warehouses, uh, seasonal work in national parks. Tell us a little bit about the workplaces. People find seasonal jobs that cater to RVers and van dwellers all over the country. One of these is Amazon's camper force. Amazon hires RVers and van dwellers to help during the busiest season when they're ramping up for Christmas. And they have this whole program that caters to those workers. They also work at the annual sugar beet harvest. That's a tough job, bringing in these sugar beets, usually working to pile them up and spending 12 hours at a time walking on concrete. There are many other jobs. People work at campgrounds as hosts, bringing in people, hauling out trash, you name it. I know two older people who broke their ribs on that job. So a lot of these jobs seem, you know, fun and temporary, but they're pretty challenging. Notable in the film is that several of the characters you profiled 
play themselves in the film. I wonder, have you stayed in touch with them and what are they saying about it? Oh, absolutely. I introduced most of them to the filmmakers. And I remember when Linda May was first on set, she would send me texts with all sorts of photographs, just telling me how it was. So we have stayed in touch and they had a good experience. And I'm blown away by how well they all did on screen. That's been exciting to see. You reported this book during the Obama years. The film gets made during the Trump years. It now comes out at another change. How did the politics of our time fit into the narrative and the story that you're telling? I think everybody, including people on the road, would be better off if we had a minimum wage that was also a living wage that would make it possible to provide for whatever kind of housing you're in and your medical bills and everything else. So I, I know we're, we're talking about that a lot in this moment. There's the fight for 15. And at the same time, I don't know that $15 is enough in some parts of the country. And this is a longstanding battle, and it's something we need to pay a lot of attention to. And are these nomads still out there on the roads or perhaps in our cities in their vans, unseen by many of us? Absolutely. Still out there. And by all sorts of anecdotal accounts, it's definitely growing. At the same time, I am concerned because anti-van dwelling laws in cities seem to be picking up speed. We're getting more and more of those, the criminalization of houselessness. And these are two trends I, I really hope we don't see collide. And finally, this is immersive journalism, right? You, this is how you work. You, you live the life. You got a van. You took on many of the jobs yourself. It was fantastic. Not because I thought I was going to magically turn into a van dweller, but by spending that much time up close, I really felt like it helped me understand what I needed to know to do justice to other people's stories. All right, the book is Nomadland. Jessica Bruder, thank you very much. Thanks. Hello, everyone. I'm Jeffrey Brown of the PBS NewsHour, and welcome to our very special edition, live edition of Now Read This, our book club, a partnership with the New York Times. And joining me is Jessica Bruder, who is the author of Nomadland, the subtitle Surviving America in the 21st Century, and of course, her book, is the inspiration for the uh, popular and critically acclaimed film that's out now. Not only out, but up for Oscars for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actress, and probably a bunch of other things that I'm not even remembering. Jessica, thank you for joining us. Welcome to you. Thanks, Jeff. Good to be here. So we're going gonna, we're gonna to take questions from people. And let me remind everybody that if you have a question for Jessica, drop them in the comments or chat or tweet us at hashtag ask news hour. We've already got a few to kick us off, but let me start, Jessica, by just asking you to, to tell us how this all began for you. Sure. Um, it began as a story I was reporting for Harper's Magazine. I was out in the Sonoran Desert in a tent for two weeks, meeting people who were out on the road and running around. And that became a cover story, which lo and behold, became a book, which became a movie. But if you had told me and Linda May, who's the main person in the book and also in the movie, at the time that we first met in 2014 in Courtside, Arizona, that all this would happen next, we would definitely have asked what you were smoking. Um, so, so here we are. Linda May, Linda May really was the first person, right? The way in. Yeah, absolutely. So, so and, and so how long a process was all this? Yeah, so I pitched to Harper's, gosh, it had to be early 2014, but I went out to do some research in, I think, late 2013, because I had a trip I had to do to the West Coast anyway, and I got them to reroute me on the way home. And I went to uh, the Desert Rose, the RV park that we actually see in the film. And that was where I started reporting to people in Amazon's Camper Force, or with them. I learned about Courtside, Arizona, which is where I did a lot of the reporting for the magazine story and then the book. So and, started in 2013, although I reported on Empire in 2011, and yeah. that's a film as well. So but when, when you say, and then the book, that, that's, a, that's a lot, right? I mean, how, what went into that? That was further reporting, further living the life? Oh, yeah. Um, I didn't really get a huge chance to immerse when I did the magazine story. I was out there for two weeks in a tent because Harper's offered to spring for two nights in a hotel, and I didn't think that was going to work. But <laughs> once I, I ended up doing the book, 
I took my advance and I bought a camper van. Uh, it's a 1995 GMC Vandora. I named it Halen because I'm a nerd. And I went out on the road with people. I think I drove more than 15,000 miles and literally east coast to west coast, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Canadian border all the way into Algodones, Mexico. So yeah, it was a lot more work. Yeah, we love Harper's Magazine, but they weren't springing for a lot of money for this, huh? <laughs> their lavish travel expenses, and it became a joke between me and my editor because I literally submitted shower receipts. You could you oh, really? yeah. local laundromat, and this was my hilarious. I'm going to nickel and dime you submitting receipts from when I got to take a shower. No, like. But that's interesting. I mean, because it's a it's a joke when you're submitting it to Harper's, but that really is the life that a lot of these people are leading. Yeah. Absolutely. No, a lot of people were using the courtside laundromat for showers. Truck stop showers were more expensive. I've actually been back and they've both inflated since I was on the road. Uh, I think the more effective approaches are the Planet Fitness membership, which a lot of people I know use. And a lot of people have adaptable situations for their vehicles, whether it's a Hudson sprayer or a camping shower bag, uh, temporary baby wipes, um, mm -hmm. you know, sponge bath, you name it. All right, so let me go to a few questions, start of our questions here. Larry Megan in the uh, Now Read This Facebook group. Thank you, Larry, for being part of our Facebook group. He writes, um, I wondered how people with no house and no address could maintain their driver's license, their auto insurance, registration documents. It's very interesting because these are very practical issues, right? He says, I wondered how people with chronic health issues could regularly get prescriptions refilled and find treatment for their conditions. Yeah, none of it is easy. Our society is built for people who live at a fixed address to the point where uh, you almost feel like an outlaw when you don't. And just about everybody I met on the road had some sort of fixed address that they were using. So some of them would work with a mail forwarding service, which would give them an address uh, that could forward their mail wherever they were. Some people had a family member who is willing to accept mail. But there are a lot of disadvantages to that. And one of them is a little thing called democracy and voting, uh, because often uh, we haven't had extensive mail-in voting in the US until this year on account of COVID. So mm -hmm. for many of the people I met, the odds of them being in the state where they legally live at the time the polls open were very, very slim. So that, that's one disadvantage. The prescription stuff is tough too, because you've got to call it in all over the place. I um, was out in the van for two months once and I needed a prescription and I don't count because I'm a tourist, you know, but my doctor knew I was out in the van and had been there for a while. And when he told the pharmacist who asked for my address that I was in a van, things got really weird, even though I have my address here in Brooklyn. Um, so I, I did get a little taste of it. No, but this goes to uh, what you and I talked about before. And I see some other questions about the, the very practical um, ways that people managed, you know, both as it, both individually, but also by becoming the community that you describe. Absolutely. A lot of people share tips, tactics, workarounds, and that's part of what I think has built such a resilient community is that people feel that they're in this together and they're willing to share what they learn with other people. I've got a question from Jennifer Johnson. The book reveals the symptoms of a financial problem in this country and alludes to several factors that contribute to the problem. Does the author have any suggestions about how to remedy the situation? Okay, well, that's asking you for some big um, policy. But first, first, let's talk about the situation, okay? I mean, what you saw, the kind of financial problems that people were facing. Yeah, the situation is problematic. First of all, what people used to call a three-legged stool for retirement finance, I'm trying to get my three-legged thing out here, has mm -hmm. become a pogo stick in that it used to be pensions and savings and your social security. And a lot of people were decimated in terms of their savings in 2008. Meanwhile, pensions have given way to 401ks. That benefits the employer because it shifts all the risk to the worker and it leaves us relying on social security and many of the people i met on the road particularly older women who'd spent a lot of time outside the workforce doing the unpaid labor of caregiving 
uh, we're coming up short on Social Security. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is we talk about economic inequality a lot, and it's a huge problem among all the so-called developed nations. We know that the U.S. is the worst. We're the most polarized in terms of economic inequality by a totally apolitical index called the Gini coefficient, which the CIA uses. Uh, and the other thing I'll share is that um, in 2019, and I don't have more recent stats, CEOs were paid 320 times what a typical worker was paid. If you go back to 1965, it was 21 to 1. That was when you could have a full-time minimum wage worker supporting a family. And where we are now, the gap between productivity and wages has grown to the point that, as we know, working multiple full-time minimum wage jobs and not sleeping isn't always enough. How, how much of these kinds of things were discussed by the people you were with, whether, you know, you talk, you asking them about it or when they got together? How, how political or policy oriented were any of these discussions? Not tremendously. And it's, it's almost hard for people to envision a time like that now. I think people wondered when they read the book, particularly if it, if it was after the Trump administration or in the late Trump administration, if somehow I'd sanitized their conversations of politics. But during the Obama administration, politics weren't the first thing everybody was talking about. I don't know if we can remember such time at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I did not hear a lot of robust policy debates on the road, to be completely frank. So I've got a question from Leah Witzig. What is your evaluation of the apparent loss of unionizing the Amazon warehouse in Alabama? What, what you, I mean, you and I talked a little bit about this last time. That was before the vote was finalized. What do you think now? Yeah, I. they ran a really robust anti-union campaign with so-called captive meetings, bringing in uh, strategists whose whole employment is based on busting things up and intimidating people. And I think it's it's depressing. Uh, I don't think that that should be allowed. I think that the union, uh, particularly in a high turnover environment like Amazon, it's very, very difficult to get the kind of traction you need to get those votes through. So I think the union knew it was taking a gamble by trying to organize Amazon. But frankly, even getting that traction, I think is probably a step in the right direction. I hope. I assume when you were reporting this book, that that wasn't even in the, you know, in the wind. So I mean, did did, did the people you talked to, and they were working for Amazon, many of them uh, seasonally, was there any discussion of uni unionization? Um, there wasn't, and part of it is this is this would be the hardest workforce to unionize because not only does Amazon have a lot of turnover. But people who are doing this just seasonally, it, it takes time to organize. It, it takes time to actually come up with a plan. And it takes people who have a strong desire to have a better future. And when your future isn't going to be more than a horizon of a couple months, people just don't really do it. Although I did meet one gentleman who told me he, uh, he had worked in McDonald's corporate. He was staunchly anti-union in a lot of the rest of his life. And I remember him telling me, they need a union here because workers just have no voices and Amazon gets to dictate the terms in a way that just isn't healthy. You know, you, you in your book focused a lot on these kinds of workplace issues. The movie does not. Uh, and and while, I, as I said, I mean, it's been critically acclaimed, it's also, there's also been a fair amount of controversy and criticism of it for you know telling survival stories, but not really going into the what what the what the workplaces are really like, what the the economics that drove all this. What what I know you're not the filmmaker, and I know you probably didn't have any role in that in particular. But what do you think? What do you think about the film and it, it, the lack of of getting into those things? Sure. Well, I'll tell you first of all, I'm not a screenwriter. I didn't get to even read the script on this, and I'm not a film critic. Uh, I do nonfiction and I stand behind everything I did in the book. And when this project was going to transition into a fictional film, I didn't expect it to replicate the book beat for beat. Mm -hmm. And 
at this point, I, I think also because we're in late Oscar almost season, people seem to be looking for me to kind of hit the movie with a stick. I've seen this lately. It's kind of a new <laughs> thing. And I rather like the movie, so I'm not going to hit it with a stick. Um, did I did I think it would be good to have a digressive exposition moment where all this stuff happens? I don't really know how that would have been worked in, but again, I'm not a screenwriter. I did think it was very cool that the film was able to open an empire um, in terms of structural stuff and in terms of history, because empire means a lot to me. That whole town blew apart in 2011. And I do remember when I was writing Nomadland, speaking with my editor about how amazing it would be if we had a character who started an empire and went on one of these journeys, but we did not. So we actually couldn't knit that part together in the way that the film did. But I'm a nonfiction nerd. I'll, I'll talk structure to you until the cows come home. Yeah, so. okay. <laughs> Were you, did you play, I mean, because I think people are wondering, what role did you play with the, in the film, if any? I know you introduced a number of the, of course, the real nomads who, be, who played themselves. I did, and I funneled as much research in the direction as the project of the project that I could, because I wanted them to have the broadest palette that they could to paint with. Um, I knew I wasn't going to get to be the painter. Uh, that that doing something like this is to some extent letting go. But I'd seen Chloe Zhao, the director's previous work. I had seen obviously Frances McDormand's previous work. And I figured if anybody could pull off some fictionalized version of a story like this, I think it is these two women. So then, I mean, there was so much material that I couldn't fit in the book. There was so much material that I had on Empire that I hadn't been able to use. Mm. So, so mostly I was, again, sharing research, a lot of Dropbox uploads and uh, introducing them to people and also going out on the set for a week, which was fascinating because I have never, I had never been on a film set before. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I've got a, a number of questions related to, to your experience living with and as a nomad and reporting on people. Brandon Corley on YouTube, how did you actually get the full-time nomads to open up to you? Yeah, I didn't go away. <laughs> That's the funny thing about immersion reporting. Um, I did have two brief undercover stints, which as a gregarious person, I actually kind of hate it because you just don't talk much. Um, but when I was out on the road in the van, everybody knew what I was up to. I carried around my notepad. I had a reporter. I, I teach at the J School at Columbia. I had my journalism school bag to be extra nerdy. I called it belling the cat, as in, I'm a journalist, I'm here. Mm -hmm. And some people didn't want to talk at first. I remember one woman telling me at uh, this breakfast, she had set up a brunch in the desert and said she needed eggs and juice. And I brought over some eggs. And it turned out there were already maybe 20 cartons of eggs and no juice that I just felt completely useless. And then she said, oh, you, I've heard about you. You're the journalist. You are going to make us out to be a bunch of homeless vagabonds. And uh -huh. no, no thanks. Turned out she was a former journalist. <laughs> oh, so she, she knew, yeah, she yeah. knew what was she coming. Thought she had my number, right? Um, yeah. But uh, the funny thing about doing this sort of thing is you don't just parachute in and then go away. So when I was still there two days later after the social event was over and we had a chance to talk and she realized that uh, I'm not the boogeyman, she opened up to me and without my prompting at all, pretty much told her whole story. I do still talk to her. I talked to her the other day. But, you know, there are also a couple people who didn't want to talk to me at all. And one of them was probably the oldest member of this social group of van dwellers. I think she was probably in her 80s, maybe late 80s, uh, mm -hmm. when I was out there. And she actually kind of pretended to be slightly doddering and out of it, which is completely inaccurate. She's one of the sharpest techs I've ever met. And I got to re—I got to meet her all over again on the set of the film. And she came up to me and said, her name is Vijay. She said, I owe you an apology. I said, I don't think you owe me anything, but let's talk. What's going on? And she pulled out a copy of the book that was just tattered, uh, really? absolutely tattered, full of marginalia. She said, so many of my friends are in here and you did write by them. And I pretended I was out of it and couldn't talk to you. And I feel like a jerk. And we had a good laugh. So I wish you were in there, but yeah. I didn't, I didn't, yeah. 
Um, here's another uh, very, um, well, because you, you got involved in some of the work as well. Chris Almack, how many days did you work the sugar beets before quitting? It seemed like the worst job, only tolerated by the truly desperate. Yeah, I was there. That's a good question. Gosh, I was there. It was funny. Orientation must have been like two days, and I was there for another three or four on top of that. It wasn't very long. It was basically in total. Uh, both of the times I went undercover, it was like one work week. And the weird thing about the sugar beet harvest was at this point, I'd seen a couple scary situations happen. We had a huge steel pole that had broken up, that, that had um, probably broken off a harvester. We saw it going up through the beet piler. And if it had hit the spot where all the dirt gets tumbled off the beets, I mean, somebody could have been shish kebab with that thing. And I, I knew what that thing was. I had crawled into it to clean it, to tear this mud that was thick as tire tread off of it. And I, I really felt like somebody was going to get hurt. And I actually did hear stories about injuries after I left. And it turned out after I left, half of my crew left. I think we were on one of the hardest filing stations with one of the roughest overseers uh, at the whole place. So I, I felt less bad and less, uh, you know, I, I really felt guilty leaving the team. And it, it's weird how quickly you normalize things because I knew I was there as a reporter, but it was this weird kind of um, doubling where I just also felt very loyal to the people uh, on my shift. And I, I felt like a traitor when I went away. All right, let me put a few of these together because they're all around your own experience. Uh, Flash 522, whoever that, whoever you are, Flash 522, what advice do you have for would-be nomads? And Cheryl on Facebook, since you literally became a nomad to research your book, did the lifestyle appeal to you at all? And then Hillary on Facebook, what was your least favorite part of life on the road and what was your favorite? Okay, starting with, well, I'll go backwards. Uh, okay. Least favorite part? was I, I froze my butt off a bunch of times. And even though I bought a Mr. Buddy propane heater, you can't run it at night. And even running it while I was reading before sleep with the windows open once, when I tried to go to sleep, my carbon monoxide alarm went off and I just yeah. you know, fell out of the van in like a tank top and shorts. It was really cold. Never feel like I really nailed that. Uh, better thermal underwear might be the answer. Uh, the best part was getting to spend this kind of time with people and learn from them. And I just remember one day taking off in the van with uh, Swanky, who's in the film. And Swanky loves rocks. She loves uh, polishing rocks, studying rocks. There are petroglyphs near Quartzsite, Arizona, and she was going to take a bunch of us there. And we all took a off after her in our vans. And I felt this kind of weird, rushing, soaring feeling inside. I felt like I was galloping off on horseback with a bunch of other people on horseback in the Old West. It was totally weird. Um, so just just unexpected moments of joy uh, were probably my favorite things about being on the road. Um, what else? Help me rewind it. I got lost. Uh, let me go back. Well, there's what advice do you have for would-be nomads? And yeah, have a good emergency fund. Because as I saw on the road, and as if anybody's seen the film, you've seen, you don't want to be one broken axle away from out on the street without your transportation, which is also your home, which also has possibly all your possessions in it. So having a good backup plan is really important. Uh, and having people who support you, if you can, even if it's somebody to accept your mail, to let you drive away, surf and kind of plug in there, just having that. Uh, that base of, of people who care, and also plugging in with the community, going online and learning about it before you make the leap. There are all sorts of resources online for newbies and all sorts of people who can, um, who, who want to help out and to commune with other people on the road. So don't go it alone, is what I'd say. Um, I'm We've got about 10 minutes. I'm just gonna remind anybody who wants to send in more questions um, for Jessica, Drop them in the comments or chat or tweet us at hashtag AskNewsHour. But we continue to get questions, so let's continue here. Um, there's one about safety. Did you see any safety concerns while on the road 
especially for elderly women. Now, you just you spoke about some, obviously, before, but um, what else? Outside the workplace? Uh, not really, and people almost seem disappointed when I tell them this. Mm -hmm. uh, apart from vehicular situations, I mean, gosh, I even, I'm horrible. I ran into a boulder and fried my ABS sensors, long story. But in terms of being out there, I did not hear accounts of violence. I never had anybody threaten me. Uh, I tell people that the biggest challenge I faced was caloric hazard because everyone wanted to feed me. But people also do take certain precautions. For example, it's always really smart to park with the nose of your vehicle facing out in case you want to leave right away. You don't have to mess around. But mm -hmm. on the whole, you know, people expect that people would have had vehicles broken into violence. And I, I really, somebody broke into my van once when I had it parked for a couple months somewhere. But I never, I never really heard about rashes of thefts or just people, you know, people getting hassled for parking in the city was probably one of the biggest issues. But again, it wasn't a violent one or a criminal one. Here's one uh, from Twitter, the Quill Marill. Maybe I said, maybe I missed this while reading the book, but what happens when van dwellers reach an age where they are no longer able to live on their own or support, support themselves with temporary work? Now you were around a lot of people of a certain age, um, what happens when they get even older or more frail? Yeah, I mean, I really wondered that. And I think it was an open question in the book because I, again, this wasn't a, a super long longitudinal study. So I, all I can tell you is what I've seen um, since the book came out in 2017. And I, I've seen a few things happen. I've seen people end up staying with or relying on family members that they hadn't really wanted to do that with. And they really wanted to feel like the parent and had the idea that maybe they would be some kind of burden or whatever, and had basically had to resort to doing that, even if it made them uncomfortable or they worried about whether their kids had the resources to help them out. Uh, I've seen people who managed to buy a patch of land and homestead there and maybe went part time on the road. Um, I've seen a lot of people who are still going. I mean, a lot of people I met in the book are, are still going more than I expected, actually. And then there's one woman in the book, and I know that she passed away on the road. And sadly, that does happen. I remember when Swanky was on the road once, she was parked near somebody in an RV, and they'd been exchanging tips about painting and art, and she liked him. And she walked by one day, and there were flies on the screen. And he had mentioned that family was going to come help him or friends or something, but nobody had come, and she had to call the coroner. And that can happen, too. So... You know, there's a range. There's another question from, this one came from YouTube. As someone who hasn't seen the film but has read the book, what aspects did you see truly captured on screen that you would define as the essence of Nomadland as a whole? Yeah. So, it's funny, there are a lot of little things. It's hard to say if there's one big essence, but I just remember, you know, towards the beginning of the film, uh, Frances's character tells somebody that she's uh, ha she's houseless, not homeless, and that's something that I heard a lot on the road. First, from a lovely guy named Al Christensen, who calls his fan his rolling steel tent. Um, but in terms of the interplay between solitude and community, between these slightly harrowing moments, like when Fern gets the knock, uh, I talk about the knock in the book. Everybody lives in dread of having somebody, you know, it's a bang, 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 three pounds mm -hmm. on the side of your van and, and you have to move on. Um, but also the incredible resilience and community. And I think the interplay between those two things, the refusal to reduce it to a narrative of victimhood and suffering and a complete lack of agency, or to reduce it to some like joyful adventure, which would be totally fluffy, the fact that it was willing to play in that middle space and hold those two ideas at the same time uh, was something I appreciated a lot because it was a line that I felt was very important in the book was to honor when people did tell me about their joys and the pretty cool stuff they were doing, even if the backdrop was this economic situation that to me often looked quite dire. This is kind of a, a, a fun one about the um, kind of language and words that a community develops this is from Audrey Joyce. There were a lot of fun and even serious new words you learned through your research. Out of all the new terms or phrases for objects, places, actions, or things, 
Um, she says, for example, Utah and Nevada for the different sides of the 13 football field long Amazon facility. Which ones were your favorites or ones that stood out for you? Oh, any, God. any, any terms you're still using yourself now? It makes me really happy that she noticed them in the book because I really keep an eye out for them. I'm a big subculture nerd. And when writing about subcultures, this is just one thing that I always look out for is elements of the lexicon, just that kind of insider slang and language. I still think about wheel estate. I think about stealth camping or stealth parking. Um, Utah and Nevada, I'd actually forgotten about it until she brought it up. So I, I thank her for bringing that in. Uh, and I think of all the different van names um, that I saw out there, whether it was Donovan, Banshin, which was a play on mansion, as in my, my van is a mansion. Um, it just have all sorts of names from the series to the playful that, you know, tell you a little bit about the occupant of the vehicle. All right, here, maybe we'll make this the last one. Um, it comes from Twitter, one-sided square on Twitter. Is this nomadic lifestyle forced or chosen? And if it's forced, do you believe the population is accelerating? All right, well, let me answer that in reverse because okay. whatever you think is going on, I do think the population is accelerating and I do think we have the makings of a crisis on our hands with the coming eviction wave following whenever the eviction moratoriums wear off, unless the federal government is somehow able to keep up with this moving target of rental assistance, it's really complicated um, because so many people are behind because uh, it's, yeah, that's a mess. So I think it has been, the numbers have been going up. I've heard anecdotally during the pandemic and I, I worry about a big wave coming in. Uh, I worry about what that means for the new people on the road, but also how it might add more pressure to the people who are already out there. For the people who are already out there, I think it's I think it's a combination because I really believe that we are all impacted by these economic forces. And we also, even if the choices are highly constrained, make choices. So for example, say you can either take off in a small trailer or sleep on your daughter's couch and your daughter really doesn't have space to have you there and you don't want to do that. You've chosen to be on the road, but you still aren't in a situation where you're able to afford lodging in traditional housing that would be comfortable to you. So I don't think it's as simple as forced or choice running from or running to. I think the answer is a lot more nuanced and you really see people all over that spectrum because quite often it's, it's a bit of, it's a bit of push and a bit of pull at the same time. All right. I'm going to first thank everybody who sent in great questions from Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And thanks for everybody for being part of our uh, Now Read This Book Club. And Jessica Bruder, thank you for doing this with us and being part of the club and, uh, and writing a great book. It's been a great conversation. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me join the club. Okay. Thanks, everybody. I'm Jeffrey Brown of the PBS NewsHour. We'll see you on television and we'll continue to talk in this way going forward. Take care.